understand what's going on around you. You are in a state of war. And you have precious little time to save yourself. It's a slow process, which we call active measures. What matters is essentials. Economy, foreign relations, defense systems. With a violent change of power, structure, and economy, period of normalization. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to put a big brother government in Washington, D.C., who will promise lots of things, never mind whether the promises are fulfilled or not. To change the perception of reality of every American. Subversion, subversion, subversion. Social media is the new battleground. This is a warfare domain. The target of the war is your mind. You do it by manipulating the youngest generation and instilling self-destructive habits and values into them. There is a strategy used against Western countries right now, especially Europe and America. This is a strategy called subversion, where you destroy a nation from the inside and the enemy can then take over the nation with very little, no resistance at all. We have been fighting an invisible battle for years without even knowing it. Eastern countries have been weakening our countries from the inside for years and we just let them do it. They gave us way too much comfort which causes weakness, comfort is the killer of man and man defend the nation. If the men are weak, then the nation is weak. They destroyed families, religion and our core values on which our nation was built. We are headed for a dark future. This video will cover exactly what subversion is, how the eastern countries used it against the west, what is wrong with the west and is there a solution to all of this. Subversion is a war strategy where you destroy a nation from the inside, you destroy their core values, you weaken the people, destroy family and marriage, maybe you recognize some of that, maybe that rings a bell, that's normal since it is exactly what is happening to Europe and America right now. Most of the West has lost their core values. They have destroyed families, have taken out the men of the family and replaced them with the government, and the people are getting weaker and weaker because of the increase in comfort. We know that the brain is a problem-solving machine, which means that if your brain doesn't have any problems to solve, it will find new problems however possible. We now have so much comfort and so little problems to worry about that we start to care about genders and what will be the next Netflix series. Major problems are left behind by most people because they're too lazy to tackle the big problems and because those problems require much more effort and time to solve. Something like climate change or overconsumption will take much more time to solve and with a global effort it can get solved. But people have become so soft that nothing will ever happen. And so once the nation is weakened, two things can happen. Either a civil war starts or another more intolerant country invades our country. Subversion happens in four stages over a period of about 80 years. The first stage is demoralization. In this stage, which takes about 15 to 20 years, they demoralize the nation. That includes influencing with propaganda and infiltration of various areas where public opinion is formed. This could be the education system, religion, social life, administration, etc. In that stage, they exploit people within the society who are ideologically opposed to the system. They distract people from real faith and redirect them towards artificial faiths like science. In the education system, they distract young people from learning something constructive and useful. Instead of mathematics, they teach children about sexuality, genders and other things to distract them from the important stuff. In social life, they replace established organizations with fake organizations and much more. The second stage is destabilization. In this stage, they destabilize all the accepted institutions of the enemy. The media places itself in opposition to society to alienate people. Homosexuals can now make it a political issue to demand human rights and instigate violent clashes. Black against white, it doesn't matter. It's about creating antagonistic clashes. That's destabilization. The third stage is crisis. The legitimate bodies of power cannot function anymore. They get replaced by artificial bodies like non-elected committees. They claim to know the answers to social problems and if they don't get the power, they take it. The next thing that happens is either a civil war or an invasion from another country. That's the stage we are in right now. And lastly is the stage of normalization. 
This is when the subversion seems normal. Once the culture is normalized, the only way to reverse it is with military intervention, but armies in the West are not powerful anymore like they used to be. And it's divided into four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization, which takes about 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The result? The result you can see. Most of the people who graduated in the 60s, dropouts or half-baked intellectuals, are now occupying the positions of power in the government, civil service, business, mass media, educational system. You are stuck with them. You cannot get rid of them. They are contaminated. They are programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. You cannot change their mind, even if you, if you expose them to authentic information, even if you prove that white is white and black is black. You still cannot change the basic perception and the logical behavior. In other words, these people, uh, uh, the process of demoralization is complete and irreversible. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already. The next stage is destabilization. This time, subverter does not care about your ideas and the patterns of your consumption, whether you eat junk food and get fat and flat, it doesn't matter anymore. This time, and it takes only from two to five years to destabilize a nation, uh, it's, what, what matters is essentials, economy, foreign relations, defense systems. Uh, and you can see quite clearly that in some areas, uh, in such sensitive areas as, as uh, defense and economy, the influence of Marxist-Leninist ideas in the United States is absolutely fantastic. I, I could never believe it 14 years ago when I landed uh, in this part of the world that the process will go that fast. Uh, the next stage, of course, is crisis. It, it, it may take only up to six weeks to, to bring a country to the verge of crisis. You can see it in, in Central America now. And after crisis, with a violent change of, of power, structure, and economy, you have so-called the period of normalization. It may last indefinitely. Normalization is a cynical expression, borrowed from Soviet propaganda. When the Soviet tanks moved into Czechoslovakia in 68, Comrade Brezhnev said, now the situation in brotherly Czechoslovakia is normalized. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis, to promise people all kinds of goodies and the paradise on earth, uh, to, to destabilize your uh, economy, to eliminate the principle of free market competition, and to put a big bravo government in Washington, D.C., with uh, benevolent dictators like Walter Mondale, who will promise lots of things, never mind whether the promises actually came true or not. The reason why subversion is so powerful is because when you destroy a nation from the inside for a few decades, everyone becomes weak. And so when the other country has to invade ours, it's easy. There is no real resistance, we don't have anything to fight for, we used to have families to fight for, now we have our 4K 64 inch TV and our $1600 iPhone. We don't have any reason to fight anymore and that's when they succeeded. The enemy country only has to invade the other country with minimal lost soldiers. That's why subversion is so powerful. You can take over a country with almost no blood dropped. Second is because they masked their ways in a positive way. They made social media look positive, they made porn look positive, they made video games look good, they pushed men to be more emotional, they made everything bad look good. And so this strategy is so good because it is invisible until someone sees it and brings awareness. Andrew Tate did a great job, Hamza did a good job, but it's a problem that you can only solve on a personal level and not on a worldwide level. The East destroyed the West for decades, first by destroying our core values on which our countries were built. We had family and religion that got destroyed. They added enormous amounts of comfort in our countries, which made us weaker and weaker over the years. Everything now is made for more comfort. We have social media, so we don't have to go out and find real friends anymore. They took out the discomfort of having to go outside, smell good, look good and improve your social skills. You don't need to face the rejection anymore. We have video games to fill the sense of accomplishment without having to face the real world and work much longer for this sense of accomplishment. We can just stay inside and have that desire fulfilled without having the discomfort of the real world. 
We have porn to fulfill our primal desires of sex and intimacy with a partner without having to go through all the rejections in the real world. We have Uber Eats, we have Amazon, everything around us is made to make our lives easier. But the downside of it is that we become very weak and dependent on the system. These things have been around for years and even decades, which slowly destroys our nation and our core values from the inside. What are your true passions? What do you want to get out of life? What motivates you to get out of bed? These are the questions you were never asked in school. Instead, you spent most of your life sat behind a desk, learning to be mediocre, waiting for the next break, the next ring of the alarm to escape. The problem is that by living this lifestyle for most of your developing years, you were taught to never value your time. From the start of your life, your time was wasted at every second of the day. And with so much boring, mass-produced, phony education being droned at you all day, your only salvation was to waste even more time at home, time that should be spent playing with other children being embraced by your community and following your passion. But instead of this, you spend your entire days learning forgettable fragments of education. In fact, this time is so pointless that unschooled kids left alone with no education catch up completely with school children at college. I think the way we do schooling is much more about daycare. And it's also preparing kids for the wrong things. I mean, eight hours a day, nine hours a day, in a, in a little group prison camp where you have sort of, you have to raise your hand and go to the bathroom and they tell you how to think and how to behave. And that, that, this is, it's terrible. By being accustomed to this life of never following your passions, this life of never valuing your time, this life of unfulfillment and conformity, your mind starts to become lazy. The ambition and drive to follow your curiosity has been crushed, so you become undisciplined. Why would you want to put yourself through the pain of constant work, practice and routine if there's no payoff at the end? What's the point of struggle without reward? By subconsciously adopting this mindset, you start to become devoid of passion and curiosity. Instead, you most likely turn to fake instant gratification passions. Passions like video games, Netflix, social media and vaping. This is why we live in a generation where almost everyone needs some sort of life coach or therapist to tell them what to do. Because our education system has taken away the driving force that allows us to follow our destiny. We don't have that force, that burning desire to achieve our goals and become disciplined. The education system nowadays is not a tool to teach you something, but more so something to dumb you down. Why? You might think that school teaches you things because you learned something, but you then forget it right after. The education system makes you believe that learning is just putting things in your brain and then spitting them out on a test. Lots of people now hate learning and associate it with something they hate. The majority of people do not realize what actual learning is. Actual learning comes from you either learning from someone else on actual real useful subjects and by experiencing these things that you learned in real life yourself. Just imagine a kid skateboarding and an adult comes in and screams at them telling them that they will get hurt. How do you think that kid will learn better? By an adult telling him that he will get hurt or by him actually falling and experiencing the pain himself? I strongly believe that that kid will learn better if he falls on the ground and actually experiences the pain in real life. So the education system just gives you outdated knowledge to learn and reduces your ability to think for yourself. If you have a university education, you just proved you could put things in your head and you will be able to repeat that process in your job. Because believe me when I say that the job you will get into sees what you've learned in uni as completely outdated. It's not relevant anymore. All the knowledge in uni has to be studied and proved before they can teach it and that can take up 5-10 to 10 years. While real life knowledge changes every 6 months. Besides the outdated knowledge there is something called double inflation. Which means that on one side more money gets printed. Which means that the value of your salary goes down every year. And on the other side the amount of people who have degrees increases which means that the value per degree decreases. The value of the money you will get for your degree decreases every year and the amount of money you can get for your degree also decreases because the value of your degree decreases every year. That's why now all the people who have a degree or go for one will soon be part of the poor class because the gap between the rich and the poor gets bigger and bigger every year until the middle class doesn't exist anymore. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And the people who have a degree and a job who think they are in the middle class will soon be part of the poor class. These are the following reasons why degrees are not useful anymore today. First, some of the more popular subjects given in uni do not benefit you in any way. They will not bring you money in your adult life. Some worthless degrees include gender studies, music, art, art history and anything else that doesn't directly equate to higher earnings. Second is that too many people have degrees today, which lowers the value of each degree. That is what I explained before with the double inflation. 
you're better off doing plumbing, electricity, and other manual jobs that people don't want to do. Third is the cost of university education, especially in America, has become ridiculously high, putting you into debt for a big part of your life. You can't go bankrupt, which means that you have to keep working to try to pay off that debt. This is becoming a new form of slavery. Fourth is that spending four years in a degree is too slow. With modern learning platforms, you can get all that knowledge in a few weeks of hardcore learning. You're better off going into business and becoming a self-made millionaire or start a career in sales and get in the top salesman by the time your friends graduate. Fifth is that the world is changing so fast that the knowledge you learn is obsolete when you get into the job market. Sixth, employers usually do not care about your degree. They want to know how you will benefit the company. They do not care about how much you studied for your degree. Seventh is that university destroys your creativity over this four year period. People who are the most creative are usually the uneducated ones, the ones that can think for themselves. Eight is that many things that you learned in uni are things that have to be unlearned since they're outdated. The skills you learn in uni are different from the skills you need in the workplace. So you have to unlearn everything and then learn everything over again, which makes the four years a pure waste of time. Ninth is that you spend four years without earning money. Yes, people argue that they will make more money after they have a degree. I really doubt it now that the value is dropping more and more. Tenth is that the teachers do not practice what they preach. They do not know a lot about the real life knowledge. All they know is the theoretical part of things and not the practical side. And the last is that material that gets teached in uni is likely already 5 to 10 years old, since they have to test it, prove it, and then put it into learning programs. The real life business world has already changed 15 times before the knowledge gets into the institution. So what you have to remember is this. You should go to university and get a degree in case something really fucks up and you don't have anything else to support your life. In that case, you'll still have something to get you some money, but don't spend all your time and effort studying to get that job. Uni will only serve as a safety net. Outside of uni, you have to try as many things as possible like businesses or side hustles because a degree will not make you enough money. A degree should never be your plan A unless you really want to be in a career that requires a degree. Religion, which is the backbone of a nation, is slowly disappearing in the West. Schools and universities have been putting communist propaganda and atheism in the youth's brains as a religion. Young people do not believe in divine power anymore and have been fed the atheism script. Religion is not only about believing in a man that rules over the world and created it. If you don't want to believe in that, that's alright. But at least respect the values of religion. Because that's what is creating the strength of a nation. It's not a belief in that almighty power, but it's the fact that people respect the rules of religion that creates that strength. And the reason that people respect those rules is because they fear that divine power and want to get in heaven after death. They will delay gratification and be a good person in this life to hopefully get into heaven and get eternal peace. But nowadays we have lost that religion and the values that come with it, on which our nation was built, and we have replaced it with our new gods including money, government, science and atheism. These gods are creating the weak man of today. They don't have good father figures, they don't have strong values, and they go for the instant pleasures that ruin their lives over time and don't build them up. With those new gods, we have lost real value like family, loving marriages, children, infinite intelligence that comes from man accessing his full potential by connecting with God and the universe and our Christian philosophy and the values that come with it. These changes in culture have happened over a period of 80 years, so men have completely forgotten what values their country was built on. Men have become weak and we're heading towards hard times. Because the subversion is happening and the West is becoming weak, so an enemy country will invade us soon. Atheism is a trend becoming more and more popular in the West. Less and less people believe in a God and more and more people believe in atheism. Like I said in the part before, is that atheism doesn't bring real values to the table, while religion does. Religion provides a plan on how to live your life and how to live it in the most happy way possible. Find a submissive traditional wife who knows her role as a woman, be a good masculine man, have kids, get married and live a happy life together. There is nothing better about life than that. But people nowadays live with no values, especially younger people. They have no real values and they just fuck around doing nothing productive. Religion has lots of benefits, you don't have to believe in a divine power, but at least respect the values and rules of religion. Atheism sucks and brings nothing good to the table.
Men have this divine energy inside of them and it is your divine sexual energy. That sexual energy is represented by sperm. So here's what happens with mass castration of men and why nofap is so powerful. A man's core desire is to impregnate a woman and to spread his seed and he will go very far to be able to do this. If a man is very horny, he could travel to another country to be able to fuck a girl. Men have an extreme desire to fuck women and if they don't, they feel a big pressure inside and that pressure can either be released or channeled. When it is channeled, men can do amazing stuff. They can use this energy to accomplish great feats. They can use that energy to build businesses. They can use that energy to do great things in the world. Everything that has ever been built was for women. This is not to put women on a pedestal, but to make you understand that we crave women a lot and we would do great things to be able to have access to them. The other way to get rid of that pressure is to release it. That's either by having sex with a woman or by masturbating alone in your room. The healthier way is by ejaculating in a woman who you are in a relationship with and you're building something with. The act of having sex builds the emotional and spiritual connection between two people. That does release the pressure and if you plan to have kids with that woman, it is perfect. Because you accomplished your life's goal, which is to impregnate a woman and spread your genes. The other way around to release that pressure is to masturbate alone or have a casual hookup. This is the unhealthy way to do it. Why? When you masturbate alone or have a casual hookup and get rid of your defined sexual energy, you don't have the energy to go out in the world and get things done and actually find a mate to reproduce with and have a relationship with. This can be explained through evolutionary psychology because when you bust a nut, the primal part of your brain believes you impregnated a woman and spread your genes. So you technically do not have to do anything anymore since you completed your life's mission. For the scientists out there, this is what happens with testosterone. When you bust a nut, prolactin increases drastically, which means that testosterone goes down drastically for the small amount of time that prolactin is high. When one hormone is high, then the other hormone is low. There's a balance between both, so for a small amount of time, your energy is very low and it takes a bit of time to recover. A metaphor that you could use to understand mass castration better is this, and I heard that one from Hamza. When you see a bull, you see a hard to control, dominant, aggressive creature. But the moment you castrate him, it's easy to control, submissive and non-violent. This is what ejaculating does to you as a man. It doesn't mean you can never bust a nut again, but it means you should control the amount of times you do it. On a worldwide level, this easy access to porn and the hyper-stimulating effect that it has on your brain makes it very addictive for men. Which means that a lot of men get rid of their masculine energy on a daily basis. What porn became today is a daily mini mass castration for men. The consequences are that lots of men have an addiction to porn and have very little desire to change their lives and do something meaningful with their lives. They do not have any anger or drive inside of them since they get rid of it on a daily basis. The reason why people who do semen retention become more successful than people who don't is because they are able to channel that energy to produce instead of wasting it on a small instant pleasure. Family is the most important thing in this world and that's what religion values the most too. Religion wants women to preserve themselves by not sleeping around because their value comes from their virginity. If they have slept around, they can't really pair bond as well with one man and they will not feel as happy in a marriage. Religion tries to preserve women, not to restrict their sexual freedom, but because they know the consequences of sleeping around for a woman. If a woman sleeps around, she will struggle to form a family with one man unless she does a lot of internal work. Family is what makes a country strong and in the past decades it has been destroyed by society. With women sleeping around, the fucked up dating market, which I will explain soon, and everything now that destroys marriages, which I also will explain soon. The man has also been removed from the house in many situations. With more and more people filing for divorce, the amount of fatherless homes has drastically increased and that's not good for boys and for girls. The consequences of this are for example amongst many more. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes, 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes, 85% of all children that exhibit behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes, 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes, 75% of adolescents in chemical abuse centers come from fatherless homes, this list goes on and on, but hopefully you can understand a little bit why fathers in homes are necessary. One of the reasons why family with a father and a mother is so important is because it gives a man a purpose in life. 
If a war had to come out in our countries, the men would fight relentlessly to protect their families. But now the family has been removed. What we have left is 90% of young men being insults with very few healthy families. Because a lot of families have either no fathers at home or the environment that they create is toxic, where the parents fight all the time. The men of today do not have purpose in life, they rarely have a loving family that they would fight for, and that is just part of the subversion process. Destroy the nation's backbone, which is religion and the family, so when you have to invade that country, there will be very little to no resistance at all. We are heading for either a civil war, because we are so divided by social media, or an invasion from another country, because it will be easy since there are no families left and no reason to fight anymore. I think we can agree on the fact that homosexuality is not a natural thing to do, which means that it doesn't reproduce new kids. You can't create a newborn from two men, you need an egg and sperm in order to reproduce. So homosexuality is something unnatural, so why would it happen in nature? Why would there be homosexuality in nature if it doesn't benefit a species at all? The basic reason for polygamous reproduction is to ensure the survival of the tribe. The alpha of the tribe banks all the women to spread the best genes and make sure the following generation of humans is best suited for survival. That is the only way of reproducing in a dangerous, threatening environment, because you can't afford to have weak descendants. When homosexuality and other unnatural behaviors start to appear is when we do not live in a dangerous environment anymore. When we are safe, have access to food, water, resources, shelter, etc. If all our basic needs are fulfilled, then unnatural behaviors start to emerge. Unnatural things that could happen are for example homosexuality, obesity, masturbation, fetishes, murder, etc. In the book The Human Zoo by Desmond Morris, the author explains how that process happens and how these trends appear in safe environments. In the animal world this happens too. Animals start to become more homosexually active when they are in safe environments where every of their basic needs are fulfilled, like a zoo. This is why the book is titled The Human Zoo. In history there is a cycle that goes like this. Hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create hard times. Guess where we are right now? Exactly. We are the weak men who create the hard times in which men will have to be strong again because the hard times are coming. What I want to discuss here is when masculine political power comes into place and when feminine political power comes into place. It's a cycle that correlates with the cycle above. I will discuss two types of monkey tribes as an example. First you have the chimps way of living. Chimps live in a patriarchal society. They have a masculine political power in which males are dominant and females are submissive. The males in the society fight and compete for status and will try to make alliances to kill the alpha male to take its place. Males will fight for access to women because women have the greatest sexual investment to do they will protect their females from other monkey tribes, so they keep sexual access to those women. Chimps live in hard conditions, which obligates them to live in this patriarchal state. They have to hunt for food, and that gets done by males and by females who don't have kids. There are male gangs that get created, female alliances don't happen here, and their sexuality is purely for reproduction, which is mostly done by the alpha in the tribe. Bonobos, on the other hand, have a feminine political power in which females are the rulers. Men are submissive and females are more dominant. Males do not compete for status and they live in a very safe environment, which means that they don't have to be strong to survive. Males will only engage in sexual activity for pleasure and socialization, but females will reproduce with males from other tribes who are stronger than the ones from their tribes. No gangs between men are created, but alliances between females are created. The males do not hunt and eat for the most part berries. Male aggression and violence is discouraged or even banned. Now what does it have to do with us? We live in either a chimp style society or a bonobo style society. When times are hard and men are obligated to become strong again, we switch to a chimp style society, where men are in power, women are submissive and men compete to be the best of the tribe. When times get easy and times are safe, the female political power takes over, where male aggression and competition is discouraged. We now cancel strong men and delete them from society because they offend weak people's feelings. We have been living in a matriarchal society for decades now where women have taken over society and men have been weak. They do not realize the importance of strong men and they try to keep the power for them. This is creating a weak country. 
Women having political power is not good and is going to destroy our nation in the long run. Women's power is not financially, but sexually. But when women start gaining too much financial power, there is an imbalance. But I will cover that next. Because you want to know that probably the number one thing that destroys relationships. You know the statistics from like scientists and researchers say it's like financial issues and all this stuff and stress. It's not. There's something that they can't measure. But there is one absolute killer of relationships and it's probably ended all of your previous relationships. All of mine. Everyone that you see around you. It starts with the same core problem. And then you know it's like oh the financial stress is annoying us now we're going to get a divorce. Okay fine. But there's one main issue that causes all relationships to break and it's depolarization. Depolarization polarization is when a man and a woman start to become too similar equals and soon enough they're more like friends than they are lovers because when you met you were so mysterious to her and she was so exciting for you there was so much energy so much newness to your relationship and it is extremely rare extremely rare to carry this on for the long term imagine that first date that you had with you know a girl who becomes your girlfriend or your wife and how nerve-wracking it was and how like exhilarating it was to be in each other's companies and you probably didn't even have any thoughts in your mind. Is it like that once you've spent a hundred hours, 500, a thousand hours together? Depolarization is when a masculine man and a feminine woman start to become too close to each other and sometimes it even goes the opposite way and the masculine man starts to become a lot more feminine, the woman becomes a lot more masculine. To stay polarized is such a beautiful thing because that is where you stay as a masculine, mysterious, strong man and she stays as a beautiful feminine woman. And this is so rare you know why because this this is very very important honestly i hope you know this sounds like a bit you know weird or just trust me i'll explain now you know why this depolarization happens why couples get depolarized familiarity too much time together in the modern day it's seen as so normal to have this desire to spend all day with your partner that's seen as like healthy and it's, it's, it seems like a good thing right until you start to compare it to every relationship of every couple up until 100 years ago the man used to be out of the house away from his woman for hours and hours and hours sometimes days and days and weeks and weeks and months and months and months divorce rates have been on an incline in the last 50 years while the marriage rates have been on the decline in the last 50 years why are those things happening first we need to address what happened in the 60s in the 60s there was the sexual revolution which allowed women to have sex more openly because there was a push for women to be able to sleep around and the pill got introduced which allowed women to sleep around with no consequences before those things, women had to be careful not to sleep around because they had lots of consequences if they did. The fact that those girls didn't sleep around made them more loyal in the marriage. They had to be careful and really watch out for what men to choose to have sex with because eventually she would have kids with that man. The price that men had to pay to have access to women was very high back then, which meant that divorce rates were very low too. You had to flirt with the girl, make her fall in love with you, then date her for a while, then ask for her hand to her father, then marry her and then you could have sex with her. The price back then was so high that divorces barely happened. But in today's western society, the price to have sex has become so low that marriages happen much less frequently because it is not a requirement anymore and divorces happen much more because of few reasons too. Marriages are the backbone of a nation and if they don't happen, the men do not have any reason to fight anymore, they do not have any reason to defend their country. So when marriages go down and divorces go up, there's an increased chance of us getting wrecked by another country who still has those values. The first reason is women's financial power and education. It does benefit women personally to have more financial power, but little do they know that on a nationwide scale, it can help destroy families. Men and women have primal roles that are ingrained in their brains. The men have to provide, protect, be leaders, father, procreate, etc. And the women have to take care of the family, keep the house clean, be there for the husband, bring peace in the household, and much more. But bringing money and providing is not on the list. Here's also something controversial. I see a lot of stories of women who have been a good housewife and have done all the right things, but then get cheated on by the husband. They complain about it ruining their lives and not being able to start all over again because it's too late. I cannot relate or understand their pain, but what I do know is how monogamy and polygamy have worked through history. Polygamy has always been the primal tendency for humans. The alpha was on top of the social hierarchy and impregnated all the women. That was the most natural thing to do because it allowed the best genes to prosper, make the future children stronger and made sure 
that our species survived longer. Monogamy is sticking to the same partner for decades in a row and not having multiple partners and even though I believe that's a really good thing, it's not as natural and our expectations about relationships should be more open. We should allow some polygamy because it's a much more natural thing to do. I don't think we should have a strict monogamy or polygamy system but a more balanced way between both. So women who get cheated on, it's natural and can always happen even if they're the best wives in the world. So back to women's financial power. I said that making money and providing was not a feminine thing to do, but a masculine thing to do. So when a woman starts to make money, she automatically starts becoming more masculine. That makes the women more masculine, the men more feminine, and the attraction starts to fade away slowly, because both people start to get depolarized. Depolarization is when a very masculine man starts to become more feminine by being more emotional, takes more care of the family, becomes more interested in the relationship rather than his work, and a very feminine woman becomes more masculine by becoming more work-focused and more focused on her purpose. Both parties become more neutral and the attraction goes away, just like a battery. Opposite poles attract each other, while similar poles repulse each other. A depolarized relationship can work on a professional level and a practical level, but the passion between both parties starts to fade away. So when the woman makes more money and gains financial power, her attraction for her husband starts to fade away, and that can be a first cause for divorce rates going up. That man becomes more feminine with time, while the woman becomes more masculine with time, and they file for divorce because the attraction is gone. Have this polarity with the girl that you're dating. Now, polarity is a very important word that I need to explain to you. Polarity means more of like a push to the extremes. So if we pretend 100% masculine is over here and 100% feminine is over here, being polarized means that you are on these extreme ends. Being depolarized means that you're closer to the middle. You're less masculine, she's less feminine. What does this sound like? A modern day relationship. Most guys are way less masculine, way more feminine than they should be. Most women are way less feminine than they should be. So most people are right here, like in the middle. Sometimes it's even like this. Honestly, like I've had a relationship like this before. But for most people, it's about here. This is called depolarization. And this is the state where the couple can be friends. Because they're so depolarized. The guy's not that masculine. The woman's not that feminine. And then they're like best friends. Because this is the friend zone. But not so much in like, you know, oh, he got friend zone. But this is literally like the friend zone where like you can be friends with your partner. And you might think that sounds nice. But like when you're friends with your partner, you will not have like this sexual like feist you will not feel like a fucking animal around her you will not ravage her the second reason is a wrong understanding of the masculine and the feminine just like i said before the masculine energy and the feminine energy are what attract each other so the more masculine the man is and the more feminine a woman is the higher their sexual attraction for each other will be we have been conditioned to believe that difference in a relationship is bad while it is the reason for attraction in the first place Men have been conditioned to be more feminine by sharing their feelings with their girl and be a good boy that listens to the teacher, while women have been conditioned to be more masculine by focusing more on their career, making money and making progress. We are becoming very similar, men and women are becoming more and more neutral, and what happens next? Attraction fades away. Men and women are becoming 50% masculine and 50% feminine, so just neutral. This might be politically correct and make a very practical relationship, but it does ruin marriages. If you have a wrong understanding of how the masculine and the feminine work, this might really fuck up your future relationships. A third reason for divorces going up and marriages going down is just a financial reason. In the 60s, when women had much less financial power, their reason to stay faithful in a marriage and avoid divorce at all costs was because if they didn't have their husband to support them, they didn't have anything else. So they needed a man to support them, and even though some women got abused because of that, most relationships were better off and families were stronger in general. Because there was a need for that partnership. The women needed the man for financial support, and the man needed the women for emotional and spiritual support. He needed that woman to get some peace in his life. He needed her to take care of the family and be loving and caring. So when a divorce happened in the 60s, the favor was for women, because she couldn't support herself. She needed money from the husband to support herself and the child. But now what? Women have much more financial power, and some even more than men, and that causes an imbalance in a relationship. Now the girl can support herself enough, because she has enough money. She has enough money, she gets help from the government, she gets help from her ex-husband, and she gets the kids. And she even gets more money if she takes the kids away. 
from a business perspective, it became a very dumb decision for men because who would invest in something where their chance of winning something is close to zero? And I still believe marriage is something beautiful that can bring happiness in someone's life, but the financial downsides for men became so high that most opt out of it. While for women, it became a very good decision to file for divorce. And just for the record, I don't believe women are evil to the point of getting married just to take money from their husband and doing that over and over again. The majority of women actually want to have a happy marriage with their husband, but just the fact that they have the option to do it can create some tension. If something goes on that they don't like, they can just leave and take the money. And here again we can talk about the feminine that is very irrational and impulsive, which means that the very feminine women base their decisions on how they feel in the moment. They will tell something based on how they feel in the moment and that's for the feminine women, not the more neutral women of the day. So outdated divorce laws can create tension in a relationship and maybe even some desire for the women to leave. And the last and fourth reason, this is a controversial one, but the sexual history of a woman can affect how faithful she will stay to her husband in the marriage. The amount of sexual partners that a woman has had in the past impacts her loyalty greatly. So for every man she has slept with, her ability to pair bond with one man goes down and her marital happiness goes down too. Women who are promiscuous can be as loyal as women who aren't. Studies have also shown that the earlier she loses her virginity, the more sexual partner she will have in her lifetime, which also decreases her ability to pair bond with one man. Now before the 60s, this wouldn't have been a problem since girls were much more careful about who they chose to be their husband because they had much more consequences. She could get pregnant because nothing was there to avoid getting pregnant and there was no real security until the 60s and the introduction of the pill. Before that, they would wait until marriage to have sex and so they didn't have any sexual history before that which means that they didn't have any issues with pair bonding with one man. The man and the woman could live happily in the marriage because she respected a man ruling over the house. She didn't have any sexual history, she needed a man financially and she was feminine and man was masculine. Which means that there was polarization and therefore attraction between the two. What's happening now is that women have much more sexual freedom, society has pushed women to act more like men, which is to sleep around more and get rid of their most valuable asset which is their virginity. Men value that highly in a girl and so we are not attracted to women who have slept around. Why? Because we care about having a faithful wife and it just doesn't feel right when you imagine her being with a whole bunch of other guys. So they now can sleep around with no consequences because they have the pill and if they happen to get pregnant, they can get an abortion. Women who have followed the script are now not attractive to men who want a relationship and even if they find someone, they will not be able to pair bond as well with that man and they will not be as happy in the relationship. Such is the reality of promiscuous women who have slept around a lot. Friends than they are lovers. Because when you met, you were so mysterious to her and she was so exciting for you. There was so much energy, so much newness to your relationship. And it is extremely rare, extremely rare to carry this on for the long term. Imagine that first date that you had with, you know, a girl who becomes your girlfriend or your wife and how nerve wracking it was and how like exhilarating it was to be in each other's companies. And you probably didn't even have any thoughts in your mind. Is it like that once you've spent a hundred hours, five hundred? a thousand hours together depolarization is when a masculine man and a feminine woman start to become too close to each other and sometimes it even goes the opposite way and the masculine man starts to become a lot more feminine the woman becomes a lot more masculine to stay polarized is such a beautiful thing because that is where you stay as a masculine mysterious strong man and she stays as a beautiful feminine woman and this is so rare you know why because this this is very very important honestly i hope you know this sounds like a bit you know weird or just trust me i'll explain now you know why this depolarization happens why couples get depolarized familiarity we live in an age where the dating market is absolutely trash and it ruins future relationships and families which means that we lose the country's backbone and we can easily get invaded by another country so what's the current situation with dating apps, guys can now show their intentions to girls with no consequences. Before those apps, men had to go up in real life and face the social embarrassment of being seen with an ugly girl. It's harsh to say it like that, but men never showed interest in uglier girls than them because you had that social shame. 
So if a guy was a 7, he would probably not approach a girl who is under a 6. But now with dating apps, you don't have that social shame anymore. Which means that good looking guys will text uglier girls just for quick sex, but do not want to get in long term relationships with her. So you have all these average chicks saying, guys only want sex, they never want to commit. Yeah, of course they do not want to commit with you because you are too ugly. These girls who are then 5s or even 4s start to believe they are at this 8 level because they get texted by guys who are 8s. They actually get texted by every fucking guy in the world. They get delusional and that's why you see a whole bunch of girls believing they are 10s and deserve the best guys. They certainly do not deserve them, but they believe they do because that social shame is gone for men. They will refuse to settle for a guy who is technically on her level, but she believes he is much lower. Their standards have become way too high. Girls get on dating apps and get hundreds and even sometimes thousands of matches and it became just impossible for average guys to compete online. Even the hottest guys do not receive as much attention as girls who are fives. So because of these dating apps, about 90% of guys are deprived from sex and intimacy. They do not fulfill that primal desire which leaves them depressed and empty. And now it's not all girls fault because men now have a quick fix. They are given porn to calm their urges, so they do not make the effort anymore to improve themselves and actually be the man women want. The odds are stacked against men and their desire to improve and get into that top 10% was taken away. So it became extremely hard for men to have sex nowadays. We also know that girls dictate the price for sex. So if a man has to date her, ask her hand to her father, then marry her, he will meet those standards. But if you only have to be in the right place at the right time at 3am, men will meet that standard too. We are in the situation where you can get very low quality for a low price, but it's almost impossible to get high quality women for a relationship because of those fucked up standards. Our countries have become too tolerant compared to other countries. We allow things that shouldn't be allowed because these things destroy us slowly. Our nation is becoming more and more sexualized with the introduction of porn, the push for sex before marriage, the introduction of the pill allowing women to have sex with no consequences and just the sexualization of the media. We have destroyed the most important things that hold a nation together, the family. Man having a family and a reason to fight is so important for the survival of a nation. But with our culture allowing more and more things to happen, we actually destroy it and make us less happy. The paradox is that the more freedom you have, the less happy you are. Now of course, if you were to go to jail and not have access to anybody, you would probably not be as happy even though a lot of people have proven the opposite. But I mean that before people weren't allowed to do this instant gratification because of religion and values and their lives were much better. But now we allow this instant gratification to happen and it's even encouraged. We indulge in bad habits and wonder why we feel worse. You might think that allowing more and more is better but in the end it makes your life worse. As I said before, the West is becoming more and more tolerant, making it weaker and weaker. We allow more and more things that shouldn't be allowed since it makes the nation weaker. Intolerant countries, the ones who do not allow instant gratification, destroying their countries will always win in the end. Why? Like I said, they do not allow weakness to occur, so they're stronger. The stronger country will always win over the weak country. The West is weak and Islamic countries are strong, or at least stronger than the West. They still have strong values, which means that they'll win over the West eventually. It doesn't have to be Islam either, it could be China, it could be Russia, but eventually one of those countries will take over the West. You see Tate moving to Dubai, you see Hamza moving to Dubai, you see Iman moving to Dubai. Every rich person is moving to Dubai and they have their reasons and it's because they know the West will fall eventually. And I guarantee you it stems back to this. It's because people essentially, and it's very simple, instead of creating this natural arc, right, which creates attraction, which, which, which is what a relationship is, right? And again, I never said one is better than the other, okay? It's yin-yang. People just meet in the middle because they want to be equal and they want to be chill, right? And now, David, why would people want to meet in the middle? You know, you always got to look at things from every angle. The reason they'd want to meet in the middle is because maybe there are negatives, to each, right? With everything, there's pros and cons. So maybe there are a few negatives to this and a few negatives to this. And people like to put those negatives on blast and say, oh, to eradicate those, go in the middle. Yes, you're right. Do you go in the middle to eradicate the 2% of uh, discrepancies? But you're also eradicating 90% of all the blessings. You're fucking everything up. You know, that's like me saying, you know,
Equality between men and women is not a good thing and I'll explain why. We are not meant to be equal. We are complementary opposites and that's the whole point. Being the same does not benefit us in any way. We need each other. When masculine energy and feminine energy is mixed and gets neutral in men and women, where women can do what men can and men can do what women can, there is no need for each other anymore. And that again helps in the destruction of families, which is the backbone of a nation. The propaganda of women not needing men and men not needing women is bullshit. We need each other. We needed each other throughout all history. Women needed men for resources and men needed women for peace. There are a lot more, but this is just the first thing that came into my mind. Not only for those things, but to raise a child. There has to be a masculine father and a feminine mother to raise a child optimally. We talked about the consequences of a father not being around, but a mother not being around is also not good. The thing is that the father not being around is a much more common thing. The only place where equality might be good is in the workplace. But even then, I don't think it's the best. But when it comes to creating a family and relationships, then equality is absolutely not okay. You can't build a family with the exact same people. I mean, you could, but there would be no attraction between both. Even two homosexual men have attraction for each other, because their energies are different. One man has a masculine energy and the other feminine energy. So with homosexuals, there is still a difference, but two masculine men and two feminine women will never have sexual attraction between both. To build sexual attraction and eventually build a family, you need inequality. You need two opposites. Each person brings something to the table that the other can't and that's why we need each other. It's our differences that make us great together. Eventually countries and nations fall. It happened to Rome, it happened to the Greek and it will happen to the West. What seems to happen is that the dominant countries remain vigilant for a while, especially when they gain more and more power. But when they're at the top for long enough, they fall asleep. They start to believe that their position is God-given and that it will last forever, but it won't. Eventually, nations fall, no matter how big they are. People love watching movies, Star Wars, Hunger Games, etc. They love seeing rebels going against the evil empire. People cheer the rebels and encourage them, but ironically, we are the evil empire. The West is the evil empire, killing rebels around the globe with flying drones. We encourage the rebels, yet we are governed by Dark Vader himself. We are helping and encouraging people who will take over our nation and destroy us the moment they are given the opportunity. This is not a racist statement, I'm just saying that letting too many immigrants in will eventually turn against us. Throughout human history, we have never cared about whether an enemy was in pain or lived in a bad situation. We were glad if that happened. We didn't let them in our tribes and help them recover so they eventually could kill the men, rape the women and enslave the children. We never let something like that happen. Yet now, we let so many immigrants in our country that eventually they will outgrow us. With them having 8 or 9 kids per family and us having 1 to 2 kids on average, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that eventually they will take over our culture and nation. It's the weak people of the West who let enemies from other tribes in because they feel bad about letting them in a bad situation. A reason why this trend is happening more and more is also because people are more and more feminine and our nation is getting ruled more and more by women. The men are getting more feminine and the women start to rule the nation. This is what I explained with the bonobos and the chimps. We are now in a bonobo type of society. This femininity causes this weakness. Women have a maternal instinct that pushes them to overprotect children and take care of people who are hurt. So they let people from enemy tribes in because they feel bad about them and their situation. I'm not a racist, I have a lot of friends who are from different countries, have different religions and it's a very interesting thing to learn from them. But if we want to preserve some of our own culture, we have to stop letting them in. People are looking to survive, so if someone sees an opportunity to take what someone has, he will not hesitate. They see an opportunity to go to a land where there is no war, perfect, let's go there. They come here, they have no money, and they see someone with money, perfect, let's take that from him. People who are have-nots just look to survive and will do anything to survive. It's not because we think that it's not right or not ethical that it's not happening. If you tell somebody that he can't steal because it is bad, he doesn't care because he's hungry and just wants to survive. Other countries around the world are not as tolerant and weak as we are. If a feminist goes to an Islam country and says that she wants more sexual freedom, they will throw her in a pit and stone her. They will put acid on her face to disfigure her. But if an intolerant country is faced with a tolerant country, then the intolerant country will decapitate the tolerant country. This is not about good or bad, it's just human nature. 
This is not a gym class where everybody gets a participation trophy. The world is brutal and cold and the weak people of the west are not ready for this and apparently not aware of this. People are ready to kill to survive and the west doesn't understand that. Trump tried to avoid his trend, but he got hated on. He was called a liar, a misogynist, a racist, and a different bunch of garbage terms that people use nowadays. But he just wanted to turn the bad trends we were on. He wanted to avoid a dark future for the West, but all he got was getting cancelled and hated on. We are our own worst enemies, and this will cause our downfall. This is all very bad and if you're still watching and this video scared you, I'm sorry. But it's better to be aware of what is happening and try to do something about it than to be ignorant and get fucked later on. Now what is the solution to all of this? Is there even a solution? I believe that on a national level, it's already too late. We can't turn the behavior of a whole nation backwards when we are already in the third stage of subversion. What we can do is change things on a personal level. This might be hard and stressful for some people, but you gotta make some online income to support yourself and get the fuck out of western countries. You don't have to go the moment you start making money, but stay, make money, and when you feel like things are falling apart around you, then you should go and take your family and friends with you as soon as possible. I don't know how long this will keep going, maybe a year, maybe two, maybe ten, but soon we will have to move to survive. Again, I'm not saying to stress you out, but to make you aware that this is a very possible future. You don't want to live in a society where you get controlled by a social credit system just like in China. It is possible that we will live in a communist government in the future. These things can happen, but we're not aware of this because we get blinded by the comfort. I fear for the future of the West because it will probably be very dark. Hard times are coming, be ready for them.